episode 96 of Strange Brow Radio. I am your host, Hope Johnson, and what a hell of a transmission we have for you today. Two abductees who met on board an alien spacecraft. Didn't know one another, met on board the craft, and now they have a story, an encounter story. A real life event. This is one heck of a transmission. So, more on that in a moment. But first, I want to talk to you about what just happened the Sasquatch Rendezvous and how you can catch what maybe you missed. So, more on that in a second. We'll be right back. A virtual conference has just happened. In fact, briefly, only moments ago, things ended for the second annual Sasquatch Rendezvous, which was available on Zoom, mainly. But we had an amazing panel of speakers that you can still see if you missed it. And the exclusive that we got from Bob Gimlin... Almost damn near two hours worth of Bob speaking off the cuff, uh, off the leash, (laughs) we might say. Thank God. And uh, just a real thrill to sit back with Mr. Gimlin and hear his perspective on the supernatural element of Sasquatch. I mean, we're all used to hearing about Patty when it comes to Bob Gimlin's story. And so that's a real exclusive treat. And the unedited version of that is available at uh, patreon.com forward slash strange brow radio. You can catch him within the full body of the conference first day, beginning morning. And to see that, you will go to strange brow radio on the Facebook page, or you can look me up, Tobe Johnson, on Facebook and We streamed everything. It was a free conference. We took donations. We still take donations. If you go to SasquatchRendezvous.com and uh, you have it in you to leave a donation, feel free to do that. But Bob Gimlin was there. Uh, Forestry, I call him a Yakima elder, Mel Scahan from the Mount Adams area and the Yakima tribe area. Knows Bob Gimlin very well. They kind of... uh, their families grew up together, it sounds like, and they both are speaking together about the same element. The It's hard not to use the word supernatural nature of Sasquatch, um, and you just got to hear it from them. But it didn't stop there. We had amazing uh, audio that we played from the Blue Mountains, uh, home of Paul Freeman's footage, a really infamous Bigfoot researcher who's passed on, but... The creatures that he looked after and looked out for still exist out in the Blue Mountains. And we played some first of beautiful Sasquatch sounds from the Umatilla Forest via Kevin Carney, who was also a speaker. Scott Taylor, BFRO researcher, a Boeing aerospace engineer, uh, myself and Daryl Adams talking about the Al Moon Lab. The folks from Resonance Production, who are making a Sasquatch documentary, who will be premiering in 2021, showed a teaser clip, like a two and a half, three minute, beautiful, absolutely stunning, cinematically stunning preview of what's coming people's way. And a lot of Sasquatch films or documentaries basically recycle the same costume, the same stories, the same angle over and over, but not with Brett Eichenberger and Jill Remensnyder. Um, what an amazing process uh, of filmmaking that those two have, have gone through and the evolution as filmmakers and now looking into this full time. They were also there uh, as well and uh, speaking about their film coming out. Gosh, I'm skipping uh, some people here as well. There was a a lot of people that ended up showing up. We had a couple 
scheduled people that were going to make it that couldn't due to illnesses, but you would have never known it. So I encourage you to look this up. Again, that is available at Strange Brow Radio's Facebook page, and it is a streaming webinar that we have posted there and linked via Zoom, also at Tobe Johnson. And you can also find more information out about this at SasquatchRendezvous.com. It's not the end of us doing live events together as a group. In fact, at the end of January, we're going to do a sound analysis PowerPoint, a didactic PowerPoint with me and Scott Taylor doing uh, probably about an hour each on what we've learned about recordings and how to sift through audio and find stuff, really cool stuff, and do it quickly, which is key if you want to keep doing it. You've got to find a way to do it really quick. So, again, Sasquatch Rendezvous, check it out. And if you can, make a contribution at uh, SasquatchRendezvous.com. Okay, well, we have uh, a, a fantastic conversation coming up. Uh, imagine, if you will, uh, a man in Australia who's going by the name Reef and a Washingtonian here near me, uh, someone who we're going to call Bill. Both abductees who meet on a craft and one finds the other and the story ensues from there. An amazing opportunity to witness something uh, incredible happening here right before your ears so sit back enjoy this conversation it's going to be a doozy all right on the line with me now from australia is reef and nearby i believe in the state of washington is bill hello guys hey how are you (laughs) it's good so uh you two have uh, an interesting background and we're going to get to how you met because it's an interesting story for sure but uh reef since uh you're farthest away and i think it's about noon o'clock where you are right now why don't um, you start where you left off or start from the beginning here with uh, what Uh, you're telling me about uh your sleeping habits as a child and we'll go from there all right so starting from when i was a child for me falling asleep as i doze off it felt like falling through a through the bed and then flying along and I'd come up to a big white light and then waking back up it would be falling from the sky and I'd see my house and I'd fall through the roof of my room and back into my bed and that would wake me up and always something a little different that happened in between there but Usually, like a city of gold or something that I'd see there. I think that was more astral projection than an actual intera- uh, extraterrestrial interaction. But always felt really different. And later on, had that sort of confirmed me and my sister doing the dishes one night. And right outside the window where we do the dishes was a paddock and then the town hall. We lived in a tiny little country town. And this night, a UFO landed in the paddock. And me and my sister see it and we're like, what the hell? Like, is that actually happening? We go on to our parents. And our parents come and look out the window, and mum's seeing a station wagon and dad's seeing an F-100. And we're sitting there saying to them, like, no, that's a spaceship, how can you not see that? And they're like, no, you two are just being stupid, rah, rah, rah. They go back off to watching TV. And after they leave, little door drops down, and I'm pretty sure there were nine little creatures walk out of the ship. And seven of them stand around the house. And they sort of created, this is my guess, they created a field that anybody outside of their mental projection couldn't see what was actually happening inside of it. Because there were still cars driving past, there were still people walking in the street, but they couldn't see these little creatures. And my parents, they were seeing two different types of cars as the one ship, and they both had different perceptions of it. And so me and my little sister, once we see them actually coming out, we run around the house and we lock up all the doors and windows because our parents think we're just crazy or something weird's going on, like we're being stupid. And so we freaked out a little bit, understandably, kids and not knowing really what was going on. But 
it got really weird when the two of them actually walked up the back stairs and knocked on the door. And so me and my sister, when my dad got up to answer it, we went to the door and said, no, dad, don't answer it. It's aliens. They've just come walking. We just saw them walk up the stairs. And he's like, no, nah. backhands my sister, knocks me to the ground, goes rah, 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 opens the door. And there's two little beings standing there and looks straight at him. And he just kind of goes comatose, but still standing. And without speaking, they tell him it's time for you to go to bed. He kind of grunts, uh, and turns around, walks off towards the bedroom. They poke their heads in, look at mum and go, yeah, you too. And she goes, uh, gets up and goes to bed. And so after they'd walked away, they tell me and my little sister that they're taking us to meet our real parents. And they lead us down back steps through the fence, which we didn't actually have to duck or climb through. I remember that really vividly that we walked straight through the fence. And up onto the little ship that when we entered it, because it was only about maybe 15 metres across. But when we entered it, we were instantly on a much larger ship that was in orbit of Earth. And we met a guy well the guy was a draconian is probably the easiest term for people to uh, relate to but just a reptilian looking really tall sort of scaly but humanoid but uh, hard to describe exactly what they look like it's not really scaly more wrinkly sort of like a vulture neck or something but There was also a female who was blonde, blue eyes, really tall, and just the most perfect thing you've ever seen. And they told us that they were our parents and that they'd actually taken my mother's seed, her her egg, and they'd spliced the female's genetics with my mother's seed and the male genetics with my father's seed. So it would be a cross between these two species that were at war. And that we would essentially be able to be mediators for them. And that was essentially what our purpose was. And then they sat us down and they showed us, for lack of a better word, videos and movies that uh, the history of formation of the earth and how the original life started on it and all that stuff. But go into that some other time if you really want to, because pretty sure I'm only supposed to be going five minutes here. <laughs> but, um, no, no, no. I mean, yeah. now if five minutes uh, can go any which way we want to, but uh, I mean, that's very specific details that you have and confirmation. Um, apart from the before my parents died, they both re- recollected the night, and my sister, if she would talk about it, she would confirm it as well. But I haven't been able to get her to talk about it since about eight years ago and Mm -hmm. the last time I got her to actually talk about it it, she just looked at me and went Reef we're not meant to talk about that stop and that was the last time I ever got her to say anything about it but you got your parents confirmation I had my parents confirmation the next day when I woke up back in my bed I was like wait I didn't go to sleep last night I don't remember going to bed and then everything started to come back and so I jumped up and I looked out my bedroom window into the paddock and what I saw sitting in the paddock was just a bare car chassis tires like the undercarriage with the tires on it and that's all I saw and I ran out of my room towards my sister's room to go and get her to come and have a look at it and she was running from her room back towards my room and we've almost ran into each other and we've both stopped and gone wait, did that actually happen? Oh my God, it happened. And then I'm like, come look at this. And we ran into my room and it was already gone. And then when my parents got up, we said to them, like, why did you, why did you open the door? We told you that there are aliens there. They took us away. Like, what were you doing? Because at first it wasn't a very, like, the recollection was kind of vague. It was remembering before and after. And it was only later on that what happened during slowly started coming back. And our parents said that we were running around talking about aliens and that we were just being stupid. And then Mick and Jim Bob turned up and they sent us to bed. 
and that was their version of the story. Okay, so this uh, is the these are the names that your parents gave them. Um, no, no, Mick and Jim Bob were two blokes that actually were friends with my parents. Okay, gotcha. and so in their minds these two blokes had turned up at the door and then they'd sent me and my sister to bed and they'd all sat up and had a drink together. That was okay. what happened in my parents' minds that they'd sent us to bed. But me and my sister walked out the door with them after the aliens had sent them to bed. And when we tried to talk to them about it and told them, no, that's not what happened. Mick and Jim Bob did not come over. And I even asked Mick, because uh, he was in a wheelchair and I'd see him reeling around and I'd go up and give him a hand, push him around and stuff. Next time I saw him, I asked him, hey, did you turn up at our place the other night? And he's like, no, I haven't been to your place in eight, six months, he said. And I was like, yeah, that's what I thought. And tried to get him to tell Dad and Dad just didn't want to hear it. And he was like, oh, bullshit, don't want to hear it. Just couldn't get his head around, couldn't accept it, what me and my sister were telling him. And... From then on, it was a pretty regular occurrence for about the next six to eight years, where at least once a month, I would just, uh, I'd have a feeling and I'd open my bedroom window when I was going to sleep, and I'd wake up on a ship, and I, a couple of times I spent like two or three weeks on these ships, talking with them, learning from them, doing all this stuff. But when I'd wake up back in my bed coming back, it was only the next day. Okay. And so, uh, let's go back here to the tall white and the draconian or the reptilian. So are you yeah. speaking to them through telepathic means? How does that work? Um, I can communicate with them telepathically when they get close enough and they want to communicate with me. I uh, can reach out, but I have to wait for them to allow me to be able to interact with them mm -hmm. when it's not physical. But uh, only two or three weeks ago, I was laying in bed and I'd moved the blinds out of the way because normally they're completely covering the window. Uh, I'd moved the blinds open to let more light in during the day. And as I was laying down to go to sleep, because the window's right at my back, just felt them there and I rolled over and was looking straight in the window at me a big white face like probably three or four foot off the ground at the first bite and as I looked at him it was like what what are you doing and pulled his head away and then he poked it back up probably about seven or eight feet high and just this big white glowing face and I couldn't really see any features in it and I found that a little weird because Normally, if they're going to show themselves, they just show themselves straight up. But, yeah, um, any other time in the past when it's been a physical interaction, it's been they've come up and they've let me know that they're going to be there and that they need me to come with them and they just give me a heads up. And then from that point, I'm in constant interaction with them until I get returned in the um, telepathic sense. Okay, and you're you're still having experiences. How often? Um, they've slowed right down. It's probably maybe once, twice a year now. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that's more because with just um, it's really hard to avoid all of the toxins and chemicals and everything they're putting in the food and the water and all that. And it blocks off senses. And also, I, I started drinking pretty heavily because it, it blocks out things that, like, um, hypersensitivity. I've got hypersensitive vision. I've got hypersensitive smell, hypersensitive hearing, hypersensitive taste buds. It, everything is just over the top for me. Like, I can feel other people's emotions so strongly, I can just about tell you what they're thinking if they're close enough to me. Uh, wow. So I've been blocking that out a lot, and I think they've kind of been, if they have been still interacting, it's been when I've been blackout drunk, so I just don't remember it. Okay. Yes, because, yeah, well, go ahead. for me, dealing with all that type of stuff, it, it just got really hard, and so I started drinking a fair bit to try to just deal with it and 
having sure. to like come back here and deal with people who I, something simple to me like oh I went up and was gone for two weeks and came back the next morning to me that seems like a normal thing but to other people that just sounds crazy as hell and so yeah it's kind of a thing that's hard to deal with when you got to interact with people and you just got so much you want to tell them and explain to them and share stories and stuff and they all just go fuck you're crazy i don't want to hear that we know the feeling all right bill uh how did things start for you well when i first moved out to the pacific northwest from uh east coast i got a job working security going around checking basically checking the restrooms, making sure there weren't any heroin addicts or meth users in the bathrooms and locking them up after dark, things like that. I was out by um, Mount Tabor in Portland. I might be pronouncing that wrong, but Mount Tabor. And I had one of the old school earbuds in, if you remember those uh, from maybe about eight years ago. Sure. Yeah, and uh, talking to one of my friends back east, and it started cutting in and out, and other voices were coming in. Um, weren't normal voices, you know, wasn't speaking English, or, uh, and we've talked a little about my history off air. So I've been pretty much around the world. I, I know certain dialects. Um, didn't sound like any human language I had ever heard. Um, anyway, after that happened, I woke up at my friend's house. Somehow I had gone the whole night on autopilot and wound up checking out of work like nothing was wrong. Although the people at work said I didn't talk to them. I just came in, hung up the keys, checked out and left. Don't have any recollection of that. So there was a good maybe four or five hour block that was missing from that night. Um, fast forward and I'll, I'll get into the story of how I met Reef. I was living in Southern Eugene and, uh, we had a skylight in our bedroom and one night, um, uh, my then partner and I were in bed sleeping and I heard our cat freaking out. It was hissing and spitting and running around. And I woke up and I remember a light came down through the skylight and it looked brighter than noon. Uh, looked over at my partner. She wasn't moving. And uh, next thing I know, something, some things came in and forcibly removed me from my bed. And again, having been you know, as a first responder somewhere and I've been shot at, I've been stabbed, I've been hit with bats and hit by a car. This was the scariest thing I ever felt in my entire life. It was, it was paralyzing. I couldn't move. Wanted to, wanted to fight. Nothing happened. Uh, I remember grabbing on, we had old school wooden floors and I remember clawing at, at the floors. Uh, don't remember anything after that. Next day I woke up and my hands hurt and the skin was actually rubbed raw and I had splinters in the palms of my hands and under my fingernails. Uh, figured maybe I had a night terror, you know, or I, I tend to be pretty analytical and down to earth. Figured maybe I had a night terror and fell off the bed and my mind kind of made up a big story. I took work off that day to kind of calm myself down. I was really anxious and uh, not aggressive, but I didn't want anyone near me. I felt very like, almost like a serious victim mentality. You don't want anyone around you. You don't want anybody to bother you, ask you what's wrong. Um, so I had these marks on my hand and just by happenstance, I went and checked my Facebook and I had gotten a message from Reef who never met, never heard of on the other side of the planet. And basically he's like, Hey man, I was the guy on the ship last night. You know, how are you making out? How are you feeling? Like it was the most normal thing in the world. And, uh, probably took me about 15 minutes just staring blankly 
at the screen at this message. Like, did that really happen? I couldn't really wrap my mind around it. So, you know, I, I texted back and he's like, yeah, he's like, you weren't, you weren't in a good way last night. You look kind of freaked out, tried to talk to you, but you weren't having it. So I figured I'd reach out to you now. And that was maybe six, seven years ago. And, uh, we've been friends ever since. So it was, it was a really strange way to meet since then. I maybe had two more experiences. I never remember actually being anywhere. I don't remember being on a ship. I remember being taken and I remember things being in my room and I remember being placed back in my room. But that in between time, I have no recollection of that whatsoever. I mean, I've got, I've got a couple marks on my skin, which I'll, I'll, send you a picture of later after the first time I was taken. It's been there for about six, seven years now. And it's nicely settled right between the marks of my tattoo. So I guess they took care when they were putting that homing beacon in me to uh, not mess up my ink, which is pretty decent. That was very decent. And you said yeah. homing beacon. Uh, I don't know. You know, you read about microchips and things being planted in abductees. And uh, uh, prior to this, I never put a lot of stock in it, you know, but I do have a mark and every once in a while it hurts. And that's usually when something happens. So I don't know if they're tagging us, like we tag cattle or what the deal is, but that's about, that is the way I met Reef. And that is the first recollection I ever have of anything bizarre like that happening to me. Okay, now where Reef remembers specifics, and we'll ask him how he found you, which is pretty remarkable. You don't have any recollection of meeting him on the craft still? No, no. Um, now, since we've talked about it, almost like a movie, you know, you, you kind of see little flashes, but nothing really, nothing solid or, I guess, uh, substantial to, to ramble on about. It was just a very bizarre, horrifying experience. And again, I think my mind blocked most of that out. Like like Reef, I actually was drinking pretty heavy for a while to kind of get that out of me, you know, like to not think about it or, you know, not really, you know, think about that, that kind of weird stuff. But now, you know, I guess it is what it is, and I've never been told if there's a reason that they got me or if there's a reason for what happened. I honestly believe Reef would know more about that than I would. Okay, well, let's uh, let's reach back out to Reef. Reef, you're on mute here, so you have to unmute yourself. I, I did that because of the sound of the traffic in the background. What do you uh, specifically recall about meeting Bill? Um... They said that they were going to get a dude um, that was AB negative and he'd been in the military so he could put up a fight. They needed me there to keep him calm. Um, the RH negative blood factor thing is a pretty big deal for them. It, and so... Okay, was, why? Well, let me ask you why. Um... Because the D antigen is something that's considered to be a Earth origin, but the lack of it is a significant trace back to the Sumerians when they first actually decided to combine their genetics with the primitive life of Earth. And uh, the negative antigen was due to the hybridization and it's a genetic marker for hybrids. And when you look up like what the RH factor is these days, you basically, it's just a, all they'll say is, Oh, it's just the D antigen. And there's like hundreds of antigens on the blood cells, but this one specific D antigen, they class it as positive or negative. And, um, yeah, basically the negative is they can take our genetics and they can crossbreed with us. And they can use us 
for experiments where they can work shit out with themselves and more or less like um humans treat monkeys in a zoo only uh, i kind of think that they're probably a bit kinder than people are to monkeys um like uh when, when they bring someone up and they have them there they've usually got someone like me there with them to talk to them and communicate with them so they don't freak out so bad over the extraterrestrial presence and have a chat with them and or try to have a chat with them, but let them know, like, hey, this is all they're going to do. They're just checking for this, and um, or they're just taking a sample of this, or they're going to be using you to create a child, and you'll get to meet the child, but it won't be able to exist on Earth because it's going to look too alien type thing. And yeah, just that lots of different reasons they've got there. Um, the night they took Bill they are interested in something to do with his muscle structure. Um, and uh, I actually remember when they were going to put the chip in and they were going to put it on one of these tattoos and I had to tell them, Oi, oi, bruh, don't put it there. And I showed them, look, put it in between the tattoo, like, uh, look there. So it actually looks good when it heals up sort of thing. Right. And they're kind of like, uh, um, it needs to go here and I'm like you don't fuck with the dude's ink come on (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and at that point Bill actually looked at me and was like cheers brother and I was like what's your name man and he's like Bill I'm like no no uh, what's your name bro like your whole name and he's like oh he told you William (laughs) because he was a little dazed out of it at the time yeah. And I'm like, uh, hey, your last name? You got Facebook? He's like, oh, yeah, William. He, you can find me. I'm like, all righty then, dude. Cool. I'll look you up tomorrow and see how you're doing. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, cool, cool, man, cool. <laughs> and then that that was about the only time I got anything out of him. Uh, after that, they were like, all right, we're doing our thing and got me to go talk to someone else. Okay, so there was more. Um, yeah, generally 10 to 12 at a time that they take. And usually they have at least two or three of us there as well. Okay, so how many other people have you contacted besides Bill? Um, that I've actually spoken to, four. So you, um, have conf- you have confirmation all over the place. Uh, yeah, um, I'd have to go way back through all my messages on Facebook to find the people because it was... <laughs> right. Like, Bill's the only one I've stayed friends with. The others, I kind of just checked up on them and answered Mm -hmm. some of the questions that they had and played my role as a envoy or just bridge, essentially, between us and them. Now, do they they have recollection of meeting you? um, There's one guy that I spoke to that remembered meeting me. Uh... And he, he was, he was like, yeah, yeah, no, nah, there were heaps of other people there, blah, blah, blah. And I recognize you. And he wasn't real interested in what I was doing there. He was more interested in this one specific alien he wanted to know about. And he, that guy, um, there's, uh, the, they're not your stereotypical little greys. Their legs fold sort of like a dog leg except they've got a foot pad that their knee can sit on so they only look like they're about three to four feet tall but when they stretch their legs right up they can get to eight or nine feet tall and the dude was talking about this alien and wanted to know like because he he got the alien's name um i think uh trying to work out how to say it in english um Probably the easiest translation would be like a general Marikarf or something along those lines. But he he had the name and the spelling and I explained to him that they're not tiny little people. They're actually really tall and they just make themselves look short. And I said to him, next time you see them, ask them to show their height. And he went, 
all righty then. Spoke to him a couple of weeks later. He went, holy crap, dude, they're so tall. How do they do that? Right? I'm like, well, if you're if they're answering your questions, man, then you don't need me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So you're, okay, well, specifics here about the greys. You're saying that there's different varieties of greys, the ones that are the traditional Whitley Strieber type smaller guys. And then there's yeah. the other smaller ones that can suddenly grow to eight feet tall. Yeah, um, not necessarily grow. It's just uh, the way that their legs fold. They can stand up or they can squat down, mm-hmm. but they can still walk when they're squatting because their top knee, the foot is long enough with the little ball pad that the knee sits straight on the foot. So they walk around just using essentially their hips with their feet. Uh, I could draw a picture for you to make it easier to understand. But um, imagine yeah, no, your it's... foot, imagine mm-hmm. your foot stretching right up to your to the bottom of your knee, and then your toes actually being able to curl up underneath your knee, and you being able to walk on the ball of your foot and your toes on your knee. It sounds impressive. It, it is. They can <laughs> jump ridiculous distances. <laughs> uh, that extremely just disappear. Uh, and quite often with those guys, they do give the appearance of just appearing and disappearing out of thin air because of how fast they can move because of that leg adaption. Okay. But, um, um, what about specifics, grace, Reef, about where where are they from? Um, depends on which ones. Like, uh, everyone knows that they call them Pleiadians, but they're not. They're called Palatians. And they're considered from the Pleiades star system, although they also occupy Alpha Draconis and Zeta Reticuli. Uh, there's the Andromedans, who are blue light beings, and they also have uh, cat like people that come from there. Um, yeah, in the Zeta Reticuli system itself, there's seven different species ranging from plain white through to jet black. All the sort of humanoid, big bulby head, almond eye type look, but different heights, different colors, different limb adaptions and stuff for what they've needed for their evolution, I suppose. Or maybe it's genetic manipulation that they've changed themselves. But the greys that most people interact with when they're getting kidnapped in that uh, what people call mantis because of the way that their uh, hands kind of curl down like a praying mantis. And those things are something that the draconian or alpha draconis or dracus plasians is the correct term. But um, yeah, those guys, they've genetically manipulated these things so that they can just remote control them three or four at a time using their minds. And so they kind of space out their mentality into these smaller Mm -hmm. drones to perform simple tasks so that they can get more hands in on a job at a time. Okay. So when people describe greys as being more of like a cybernetic uh, cross between, you know, a robot and a living organism, is that close to the truth? Um. I'd say, yeah, uh, the reason that they get the mechanical feel from them is, for lack of a better word, the clothing that they wear. It only actually shows when they move, and it, it's kind of skin tight, but when they move, you can see that they're wearing something, but when they're standing still, it doesn't, and it gives them a shimmer and almost a metallic appearance, and... Um, yeah, they, they do look somewhat robotic in their movement and their but I think that's due to the like cloning and the genetic manipulation and the fact that there's multiples being controlled by the one person that people get the robotic feel about them let me let me go over to uh, Bill here now and I'm going to mute you again Reef because of the traffic Bill he's saying quite a bit here Um, he has a lot of specifics and they seem to add up based upon the fact that uh, how else would he know that you had missing time and reach out to you relatively quickly with a first and last name? 
Yeah, it was. Um, I'll say also there was another another incident that uh, Reef filled me in on when he brought up those insect like beings. Um, and I'm not good with the names, but uh, one time after he and I had become friends, a different group came. And once I, I sent him a picture, I scribbled out a little picture of what they looked like. And I, well, he had all the information on it. And same thing, like uh, the fact that he knew what my blood type was, the fact that not only he knew certain things before we met he told me exactly what my tattoo looked like and i did not have that up on my facebook there's no way he could have known that there's <clears throat> virtually no room for coincidence um i don't have the vast amount of knowledge that he does when it comes to them i can only speak to my very few experiences and the bond he and i have formed because of it Okay, did you say Bonte? No, I said the bond he and I have. Oh, the bond. I thought it was the name of a specific race. I'm sorry. Oh, no. No, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. I don't I don't know I don't know any of them and mm -hmm. I get confused a little too easily with the long names to be honest with you. But Did you uh, say I, that another group came for you? Yeah, yeah. Um maybe about a year and a half, 2 years after my first experience, uh, same thing. The whole room lit up with light. Although this light had like a purple tinge to it, almost like if you rub your eyes too hard, you know, you get that weird kind of like sunburst with the different colors. Right. And so the next day I shot Rafe a message. I said, look, this is, this is what showed up. It was very bug-like and did not have a good feeling. It, it went beyond being afraid. It had a very malicious feel to it. And yeah, he, he was able to explain what those were, where they came from. He even sketched out a picture the same time I did and we swapped them and they looked almost identical. Do you guys keep these pictures? I've moved twice since then. Well, three times since then. I have them somewhere. Not quite sure where. I'm sure Reef may have a few kicking about, but I think he's moved once as well, at least mm -hmm. once. So, but yeah, I've got them somewhere, probably with my photo album. I can do some digging and see what I find, and I'll I'll send them to you all fair. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, being an abductee is that what you would call yourself, or an experiencer? I would say abductee experience implies some sort of consent or some sort of willingness to go. And at the time I definitely didn't have that. I was mm -hmm. mortally, mortally afraid. And, uh, after the first group, you know, that was one thing. The second one was a whole different experience. Nothing, nothing good was about that. And, uh, I would definitely say abductee as opposed to experiencer. There was no communion type of happy ending where we all danced in a field, you know, it was just kind of a wretched. The second one was a wretched experience. As far as the theory that uh, we, we're monkeys in their laboratory, uh, is that how you feel as well? Yeah, absolutely. I would go maybe even a little lower on the, on the mammal totem pole were probably like lab rats. And in fact, is a weird side note, my partner, when I had the first abduction, uh, we're no longer together, but she developed a brain tumor within a couple months of my abduction. And still alive as far as I know, but it's just a hell of a weird coincidence that someone's so healthy, she was in the, um, physical fitness and healthcare field. So very good head on her shoulders, no vices, um, just suddenly developed a brain tumor out of nowhere. Have you had any health concerns that seem related? Mm, no, no. I get every once in a while kind of flashbacks, you know, PTSD, 
but nothing physical. Aside from the mark that I have, nothing physical. And w when you have one of these flashbacks, do you reach out to to Reef over where you're at emotionally, trying to deal with this, or how do you cope? You know, it it depends. Um, and I hate to be, you know, so blunt, but medication helps. You know, I'm on PTSD meds and uh, use those very sparingly for when it becomes really intense. But yeah, normally uh, Reef is able to either field a call or a text message from me. We chat about it and it it helps a great deal. And it helps to know, you know, that I'm not the only person that this happened to. But you've only had that one experience with him. With right, as far as I know, yeah, there was, you know, like I said, the second time was with a different thing, and then the third time that I know of um, was with the original group, and I believe Rafe was there. Reef was there for that. I uh, I don't remember much of it. I just remember him texting me. He's like, "You doing all right? I saw you last night." And, you know, it kind of jived with, uh, again, time loss and the sleep paralysis. So the fact that he reached out to me, but as far as I know, there's only been three events. Right. Reef is kind of the sober driver in this yeah. situation, and you've uh, gone through a series of blackouts here. So it's it's interesting to, uh, I mean, it, more than interesting to see the dynamic. Um, Rafe, I'm going to take you back off mute if you can unmute yourself again. Um, I'm going to yep. ask you. Back. Oh, you're, muted. you're muted, man. There we go. Sorry. I hear we unmute ourselves. Uh, your specifics, Reef, with talking about language, understanding languages from another world yeah. um how familiar familiar are you with their language and um can you help us understand how any of this works as far as their communication with us and if they have any messages uh, that we need to know about for the upcoming you know events um they consider english the only language of humanity worth them knowing understanding fully and actually embracing because it's their languages are extremely advanced and english is the most descriptive language it has the most words for describing the most things on the planet and they consider it to be the best language but uh there's also ones that have Russian. There's also ones that speak Asian, but they're only small specific groups. Whereas an overall larger group, like they all learn English or at least to understand it. And for me, with the times that I've been away, I have learned substantial amounts of quite a few of their different dialects and languages. And, um, I mean, I, I can actually do vocalizations that just you wouldn't think were human. Okay. And so you, do you communicate with them in their language or is this mostly telepathy? No, um, if I'm talking to them, like uh, quite often if I go out into the middle of a forest or like a lot of bushland or national park type area, um, when I go walking out, and I'm setting up my tent, I'll, just on dusk, I'll walk around and I'll scream out for them, for anything that's around, for anyone that can hear me. And I'll tell them, and essentially it's, I'm here, I'm doing my thing, you keep away from me, I'll keep away from you. Uh, that's on... Um, uh, almost pure draconian and a lower dialect which sounds a lot like that video that I saw of you uh, I saw on your page that got us talking is um, uh, more of a like um, 
ancient Akkadian dialect, which it sounds like, which I'm also would relate highly to Atlantean language and um, the guys who actually speak that, they they have um, traces of African, Asian and Latin through the way that they speak and I heard a full sentence structure of that Drucus Plasian in the video that you shared and I was like, hey, whoa, that's not human talking there i know that language and i know what they're saying <laughs> and hold on just light and see right no oh, yeah go ahead light it up <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um yeah uh i've listened to it a few times and i've listened to the lion tamer video and what i believe is that you've got possibly something with that Russian video that's been put in the background to throw, but there's definitely someone else in the room talking at almost the exact same time as that video, which is why, and they're speaking in a slightly lower tone, which is why when you're registering it, it looks like it's going to register up. But at the same note, if you look at the smaller details on the lower registers, they'll be very mm. different. Well, yeah, I mean, it's either Russian or it's not, right? I mean, if it, if it comes back as transcribable through Russian and nothing else, um, I don't know what else to do with it, but is it possible that, I mean, are you saying that uh, those mystery women are draconian and that we've been hoodwinked by someone who's overlaid the audio somehow over a video? I think the... It's possible that there was a draconian or mm -hmm. someone speaking a draconian dialect who mm -hmm. was there and they were definitely talking in that video. Because mm. you have they... specifics of what they said, too. I mean, you you transcribed yeah. it for me. Mm -hmm. And what do you remember uh, just the, you know, the give me the outline of what, what the dialogue actually is. Okay, so... What I heard was a lot of background, a lot of screeching, but the words that I make out in it, it's a mother telling her child, you're not meant to be here. And the kid's saying, I'm just having fun. They're silly. And the mother's like, no, nah, they're smart enough to catch your father. Go home now. And the kid tries to argue and she's like, no, go home. But really jumps down their throat and then it stops. Yeah, it's interesting because that's kind of where our heads were at, too. And then, of course, we get the video sent to us, and it's a, a woman at a zoo. So, um, you know, that's one of those things that uh, I feel like is going to haunt me forever. <laughs> but not in the same way that you guys have been haunted forever. And speaking of hauntings, uh, oftentimes when we talk to witnesses that uh, have a supernatural event in their life, they have other supernatural events that coalesce around either certain spots or certain people. It's not just <clears throat> being contacted by this one foundational phenomena. There are these others that it seems to attract. So is that the well, case for you, Reef? Always, yeah. Um, they say everything comes in threes. So... Once you've interacted with higher life forms, even if for people who don't remember it, they tend to develop abilities. Um, like Bill actually has my favourite ability that I've ever come across. I think he's the, he's got the coolest thing ever. He can literally hear rocks sing and just walk straight to like gemstones and stuff. He can hear them singing and walk straight to them and pick them up. I have a ridiculously high empath power where I can just about read people's minds just by the way that their emotions are going and like I can essentially feel their thoughts to a point where I know what they're thinking. It does sound crazy. <laughs> Is that and that's something you can't turn off? Not unless I get real drunk. <laughs> okay, this drinking that's switches it off. Okay. 
uh, I, I can't really interact with people more than mm -hmm. two or three people at a time unless I've actually had at least a couple of drinks because it starts to dull it down. And mm -hmm. uh, if I'm going out with someone just to have a drink at the pub, I've got to have two drinks before I do because otherwise I can't go into the pub without just shutting down and not being able to talk to everyone because I'm just overwhelmed with all the emotion and everyone's right. feelings and the brain getting flooded. Yeah, it, it's really full on and it sounds like it could be cool, but it's really not. It's It sucks. <laughs> Okay, and what what side of, I mean, it, it sounds like you have two extraordinary sides of your family this could belong to. Does that belong to the draconian or the tall white, or do you have any idea? I mean, is one more gifted in that direction? Um, well, funnily enough, what most people believe of the draconian is that they're essentially emotionless and heartless and all just evil and bad and eating people like people generally don't have a good view of what draconian is but that's a i feel it should be known is a forced perception that the government wants people to have because they want them to be scared but if you look all the way back to the native americans the hopi indians and their tales of the snake brothers who came from underground and sheltered them and kept them alive when there was a media shower that came down that would have wiped them out that tells you straight away that the reptilians are not actually the bad guys and they're actually the ones who have the high powers of empathy the Plations, they're they're all intellect they're all logic that they, they do empathize but they don't have empathy in the sense they don't have the psychic ability of empathy but they um they have the knowledge and the logic to be able to put themselves in other people's positions okay so oh there's a sound for you i'm gonna put you back on mute here Reed. Yeah. okay bill um your ability to now i want to make sure i heard reef correctly here you have uh, an ability to go towards precious gemstones because they make a sound, they sing. Is that what I heard? Yeah, it's, um, you know, some people would say it's luck, but I actually have a feel for, you know, uh, what a good area is. You know, if we go out on a rock hunt, myself and my friends, you know, I usually zone in on what's good, and it, it's as if I feel it calling to me i call it singing you get a good feeling towards something and you dig it up and sure enough you you've got yourself a nice opal or really nice chunk of carnelian and i've had that for you know oddly probably since the first time i was taken that it got it got really mm -hmm. developed like that did you ever think that they gave you that to mine for them? I mean, do you feel like uh, this is a, a superpower for them as well? <clears throat> you know, not unless they somehow grant me a lot of money to open my own mining company. No, but I do know that, um, you know, people like uh, Van Donegan and um, a lot of other writers believe that that's what started the need to interbreed us with an extraterrestrial race when we were monkeys is that they wanted us to mine gold and precious gems for them. I don't know. I don't have the answer for that. I mean, I, I feel as though if that was something that they wanted me to do, um, I tell you what, the next time I go gold panning, I'll let you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll get a good score out there. <laughs> what about, uh, these other activities that seem to happen around the initial experience, uh, ghost activity, <clears throat> cryptid experiences. Have you had anything like that? Do you seem like you're an antenna or a beacon for weirdness? Um, well, that's my whole life. I feel like I've been kind of a beacon for weirdness. Um, I've seen a couple ghosts at a young age, and I, I've had the interest since I could pick up a book and read. Um, and we, we talked about that a little earlier. I've got a, a very extensive library. Um, in fact, we went down to, my partner and I went down to Mount Shasta a couple weekends ago. Unfortunately, it was closed <clears throat> because of the fires down there. 
but that's another hotbed for UFOs and, you know, reptilians. And I know a lot of the Shasta natives have stories about um, underground passageways through and into Mount Shasta. I wanted to go out for the full weekend hike, but wasn't meant to be this time. Um, as far as ghosts, again, I, that's something that I feel I've been in tune with since I was young. I don't think it's really amplified or declined since my experience. Excuse me. You're quite all right. Thank you. But yeah, so, um, I, I've ahead. never, sorry. I, I haven't seen any cryptids. I'd like to. Yeah, you know, I grew up in South Jersey where we learned about the Jersey Devil and you know, all sorts of interesting things out there, but haven't seen any Bigfoot, you know. Sorry, sorry to cut in for a sec there, but like Bill, there is and all the little goblins and gremlins and shit. They're kind of classed as cryptids, bro. No. Yeah. So well, are, you, are you leaving some details out, Bill? Yeah, a little bit. You know, uh, I've caught some, I guess you would just maybe call them fairies on film, little flittery creatures and uh, I'll get some of the pictures and I'll, I'll send them your way. Um, but that's been going on for maybe the past five years now, you know, mm -hmm. just, uh, you get kind of a feeling. Sometimes it feels like you walk through a big cobweb and you take a picture and all of a sudden there's a little orb or a, what looks like a little person in the background hiding mm -hmm. in the underbrush. But, you know, I mean, that could be, that could be a, cultural thing too you know a lot of european countries believe in that and you know, still to this day I have, I have relatives who believe in that so that could be one of those uh causation things where if you grow up believing in something mm -hmm. you know you'll see evidence of it sooner or later given the fact that we're in the a wave of disclosure here where we now have a whole section of the Navy that you can send reports to. It's being disclassified for whatever reason or however they're trying to control the narrative here. Uh, what's your instinct tell you, Bill, about what's coming? I think, you know, realistically, I think maybe within two years, our government might issue an official statement. Um, that's my hope. You know, there's there's a lot that plays into it, you know. Um, I'm trying to think of the most eloquent way of putting this. Oh, for example, uh, one aspect is these beings might not want to be known on a worldwide scale. I mean, we're the only species that hates other of our species just because of how we look, you know, or what we believe or you know, what our orientation is. I mean, if I were to land on a planet with a bunch of angry, hateful little monkeys, I probably wouldn't have much to do with them, you know? Um, I think, again, with, with more and more things being declassified and um, now they're making, I, I believe the Navy is making units to actually go out and investigate sightings. I hope that we we kind of follow in line. Uh, I believe Spain has pretty much full disclosure that they, that they know that there are UFOs and that people see these things. They can't explain it. Um, I, but then again, you know, ignorance is bliss and people like to kind of be stuck in their own little narrative. And I'm, again, I'm hopeful that may be an official, this is what's going on, this is what we know. But that might not be the case because if you think about it, that would put people's lives upside down, you know? I mean, if you had, mm -hmm. you know, religious zealots, then they have to question their faith and then the people in power might lose control because the narrative that they've spun is wrong all along. Mm -hmm. It could cause a, a certain amount of chaos, but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful people will eventually become, you know, wise enough to maybe have an open mind about it. You know, it seems to be more and more kind of widespread throughout the media. You know, it used to be that if you saw someone talking about an alien abduction on like the 
Maury Povich show. You know, they were ridiculed. <laughs> and, you know, now there are shows like yeah. yours where people can come out and talk and say, look, this is what happened to me. I don't have the answers, but mm -hmm. this is what happened. I think more and more people are getting an open mind and there's less <clears throat> less of a stigma. It's still there, you know, but it's 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 lessening, I would say, by generation. I think yeah. the generation behind me is a little more aware, mm -hmm. a little more open minded. They seem to question a bit more, which is great. So maybe, maybe in another two or three generations, there might be a uh, a legitimate first contact on a public scale. And you just said uh, ignorance is bliss for a whole host of people that don't want to look down this rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find yourself wishing that you were still ignorant? No, not at all. I. You know, it's funny. I think it was um, maybe eight, maybe 10 years ago. That not this pope that's in office now, but the one before. One of his bishops had released a, a statement from the Vatican saying it was okay for Catholics to believe in extraterrestrial life or the possibility of. And uh, you can Google that. It's a real interesting article. Kind of interesting that, you know, a head of a major religion would release something like that. You know, it kind of sets the groundwork for maybe a little more information being leaked out every couple of years until it's all but common knowledge. Right, and they did that before the uh, To the Stars Academy uh, mm -hmm. worked with the New York Times, so I agree with you. Uh, Reef, um, you just sent me a picture here. I'm looking at it. It's a nearer a set of boulders here. Uh, tell me what I'm looking at. Describe for the audience uh, what this photo is. And you're on mute again, so you have to unmute yourself here to to tell me. Ah, there we go. Yep. There you are. Okay, so um, that picture that I sent through, if you look at the little thing, little face with half red, half black with the gold eyebrow trim and the little brown hood on it. I'm looking at it uh, here, peeking up. Uh, something's jotted up from behind a mossy boulder that looks like it yeah. has kind of a red hue. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how good the quality of that will come through for you, but... Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see all that right. at all. Now, um... I'm going to see if I can show Bill. Or maybe I can... Yeah, I can... B Bill's the one who took the picture, and I oh, found Bill. the little thing hiding in it for him. <laughs> okay, oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, yep. Hold on, I'll just have to forward the whole big one through and then I'll edit it once I've sent it. So these things show up all the time on photos for both of you? Not not um, all the time for me, no. no what about you, Reef? Um, oh, I don't really take a lot of photos or pictures or anything, but... um. That's mainly just because I see things all the time. Like, just visually, I see things that normal people just wouldn't be able to see. And I don't know. It's what? like I kind of feel like when I try to take pictures of them, it never show up. So I just... Uh, Reef, what, I've just what never is really the, been good with that. Reef, but I'm, Reef what, is, what is on the way? I just asked Bill this question, too, in the wake of disclosure. It seems like you would have more of an answer than most is there anything um, that uh, we need to be prepared uh, for in the next unless things have been changed 2026 uh the andromeda and blue light beings are supposed to be making themselves known to us okay and what kind of temperament do they have is that something that we're going to get along with yeah, they're, they're peaceful they'll be coming here to try and help people like raise their vibration mm -hmm. not I suppose that humanity as a whole tends to be pretty self-centered as individuals. If you get everyone together, it's in groups of, we want this specific thing. We want this specific thing. And everybody argues, nobody wants to agree on anything in between. And these guys, they, they just, um, they've learned about the higher dimensions and they know 
that essentially you create your own reality and they're going to be coming down and teaching people how to interact with their reality and how to actually change things and give us more information about the past on a level where it's not like us on a, a podcast where people can go, oh, that's just conjecture. They could be making that up. They'll be giving us real solid proof, information, facts, and going, yep, sweet as. That is well, um, essentially education is their purpose. Yeah. Humans have a lot of potential, but they're stifled because that 1% putting fluoride in the water, putting chemicals in the food, like, we're all essentially being poisoned and we're all, even myself, we're all way lower on our abilities than we should be able to, than we should be. Hold that thought for a second, Reef. I'm going to ask this question to both of you. Did someone uh, just have their speaker on? Did you guys hear a voice? Um, yeah, my screen showed up that Bill's speaker was on. Is it on? Can you hear me? Well, mm -hmm. no, my question is, is, did you guys hear somebody else's voice that's not yours, or is there someone in the background, maybe, Reef, that spoke? Oh, no yeah, one... um, okay. a uh, little fella on his PlayStation in his room, he just got a bit loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, it sounded like a male voice, it was kind of mechanical, and, uh... Oh, okay, I heard, like, a kind of croak sound, I thought it was just Bill Coffin. <laughs> no, no, uh... The audience probably heard that too. It was interesting. I mean, it was definitely language. And okay, you know how it didn't this come stuff works. On one. Did you hear that at all, Bill? No, I didn't. Can you? Will you be able I, to play it back, or is it? Well, uh, eventually I will. Um, but you know how this stuff works. It's it's kind of hard yeah. to figure out what's going on when you have three different people all over. Um, very interesting. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that'll be cool to listen back to. What do you guys have planned? Do you, I mean, let's say COVID wasn't in the mix. Did you guys ever have plans at all to meet? Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and, I'll be honest. I, I'm afraid of Australia. I've got that perception that everything <laughs> there wants to kill me. And uh, right. I, I'm yeah. not a big fan of kangaroos. Those things freak me out. I don't know why. <laughs> There's something unnatural about them. Mm. <laughs> but we'll make it we'll make it happen we actually have a plan to go look for opal out in australia yes. together so oh wow yeah now out in uh underneath mount adams is uh e seti ranch and they have the australian version out uh i don't know what part of australia maybe near melbourne but i i got connected with the e seti ranch uh as far as their australian version of themselves and there is quite a bit of activity all over australia it seems like oh, yeah. uh, abductions run amok out in australia yeah. to the degree now is it the fact that you guys have more experiences or is it the fact that you guys are more willing to talk about it um Go ahead, that uh in australia the ancient peoples they had a lot more interaction and their culture is still a lot stronger close to their original culture like um we've got aboriginals who live way out in the middle of australia in the deserts and all over places in what they call communes and but they still a lot of them they still live very much like their ancestors did and they still interact with the sky people and uh, if you go out and talk to them that like our uh, native americans when you go out and talk to them on the ranches and whatnot and they talk about the sky people and yeah, all that type of stuff but australia um is there something unique about it i mean is it the cradle uh, I, of civilization that, is there something more there um well cradle of civilization was um Shumer, uh it's um in africa but that's only the main one. Australia, I feel like maybe actually what was considered new, if you look at the way that the maps fit together and where Australia would have joined onto the um, bottom of the African and Asian continents where it would have fit just about right in between them, 
and that's where the land of Mew was supposed to have been. But I've never actually even thought about it that much. Just mm-hmm. in Australia, it doesn't really matter where you are. You can walk out on just about any night, and if you spend 20 minutes looking at the sky, you'll see something. Yeah, well, I mean, do you get a sense, Reef, of where to look? I mean... Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Me and my partner actually, at least a few times a week, go outside and just stand there and we'll be walking and walking and just be like, oh, over here, and it'll just come up and just start moving around and... Yeah. Uh... Now, Reef, are you chipped as well? Yeah, mine's in my foot. Okay, and do you know right where it is? You can feel it? Yeah, I know exactly where it is. I've been able to feel it since as long as I can remember. Every now, now and then it... it plays up a little bit. Right. What do you mean by plays up? Because um, it's buried dead center of my foot, essentially. Every now and then, like when I was, not for, not for a few years actually, but when I was growing, um. I'd often feel like there was a piece of glass or something, like there was something actually stuck right up in the middle of my foot. But it was in a spot where I'd never actually stood on anything. Mm -hmm. I'd cut my feet up all around the ball and heel and along the side, but right up in the centre, I'd never actually stood on anything there. And I'd... Yeah, when, when I was growing, I think it was just the muscle trying to get around the chip that I was aware of it. And now, it just kind of feels like there's a lump there. It doesn't get painful so much. Uh, except for when it's really cold and then it feels a bit like a bit of glass again. Now, Bill, I'm looking at your tattoo work and uh, a, they definitely went dead center into the skin away from the ink. Uh, the red the red spot, is that what we're yep. looking at? Yes, yeah. That is, uh, that's my little mark or chip or whatever you want it, to call it. It's not little. No, no, not at all, and it's... Now, why would that be, Reef? If they're so good at putting these in without people noticing, why is his so noticeable? <laughs> he, he wanted it to be. What do you mean by that? Well, um, he was like, how am I going to... Like, this is crazy sort of thing. Like, how am I going to prove this to people? And so it was like, well, just make it obvious. They did. Uh, they definitely made it obvious. Yeah, yeah, it it stands out well, and it's essentially so that when Bill says, "Hey, this happened to me," and people go, "Yeah, yeah, where's your proof?" He can go look. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, do you feel anything there, Bill? You know it. I don't feel anything in the skin or the muscles per se. I mean, so no, nothing, nothing bulging or jetting mm-hmm. out or anything like that. Have either one of you had these x-rayed? Um, I, guess... I haven't had mine x-rayed, but my little sister did have her foot x-rayed and there was a, they didn't, they couldn't say whether it was bone or metal or what was actually stuck in her foot, but there was just a little piece that was floating around that shouldn't have been there. And Bill, you have not? I have not. I My last private physician, I asked him what it was, and uh, he said, well, it could be eczema or it could be a rash. And then he just kind of left it at that. I went, all right, well, thanks. Was, right. No yeah. real help. Yeah. And it stays that color? Yes. Just yeah. year round all the time. And it almost matches the red ink, actually, for the other part of my tattoo when you see it in person. Which is that right? Is also nice. Yeah. 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 It's uh, just to describe here, you have quite a, 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 what I call that, a tribal two on your shoulder? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And inside one of the crescent moons is. Uh, a blood blood center. I mean, it's a it's a bright red center in in the ink there. Um, really interesting. The whole thing is fascinating. Uh, Reef, I I would be remiss if I didn't ask you whether or not um, you have offspring. 
yourself off world? Um, off world. Or here, uh, or here. I mean, are there? Um, do you have no, other hybrids uh, around? Uh, I have had a lot of trouble breeding. Um, every time I've ever gotten a chick pregnant, she's miscarried. Whether she's been IH positive or negative, but um, mm-hmm. my partner at the moment is O negative, so I've got my fingers crossed that it might work with her. Mm-hmm. But while I haven't actually fathered children off world my genetics have been used for crossbreeding purposes yet and have you seen those children uh seen a few of them yeah on ship um how does that work i mean have you been to their planet uh yeah i've been to other planets but um i reckon save that for another time (laughs) um with the offspring thing, it's um, more when they're old enough and they get curious. Mm-hmm. Or when they reach a certain age, then they're given the chance to interact with human parents. And mm-hmm. generally, their decision is that they don't want anything to do with them. But you, I mean, don't, have it, a, you don't have a mate, a, uh, an alien mate of any kind yourself. That you could, that you have relations with or anything, or you no. do you? No. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just stick with no on that one. <laughs> okay, gotcha. And how about Bill? Have you? Uh, do you have any experiences at all with a copulation with an alien race? Uh, unfortunately, no. I I have, or maybe fortunately. I was going right. to try to make a joke there, but... Uh, right, right. Yeah, no. Go uh, with Jay and Silent Bob. Can you imagine being the first man to meet an alien species <laughs> and fuck it? <laughs> you know, not that I'm aware of. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we'll wait for that adventure if it happens. Okay. I mean, are you open to such high strangeness? Yeah. You know, I'm... The world can be a strange place, you know, if you have the mm-hmm. right friends and the right mindset. And I'm yeah. open to it. Okay, well, you heard it here first. Um, it's a, it is a very strange place. And I, I appreciate both of you coming on. This was an impromptu interview that uh, we, we put together in the last 24 hours, and we had to cross uh, the time zone 17 hours and uh and made it happen um i i would love to have you guys back on so um maybe we can just call this chapter one between reef and bill that sounds, sounds good. good okay perfect all right guys well i appreciate you coming on the show and uh have a good afternoon and evening and uh we'll talk soon all right thanks Cheers for having, having us man okay well That was part one of part two. You can be assured of that. Listen, I believed every word that came out of both of their mouths. There was a whole lot of consistency, and they were basically filling each other's sentences in. It was uh, an incredible interview from front to back. The tattoo, the first and last name, which unfortunately I had to censor out, but the private conversations I had with them that you don't know about beforehand... Not not always do I get the chance to do a pre-interview, or do I necessarily want to do a pre-interview. But Bill in particular, who has a a professional background, wanted to make sure I knew the caliber of his, uh, his resume. So, you know, everything short of actual identification on that one. I I was just really impressed with it. I, I think you all probably are as well. As far as uh, part two and when you can expect that, well, I think relatively soon. I think we need to get to the heart of the matter of where the heck Reef has been and what he's seen. Incredible details about RH negative blood, about the fact that he's a handler. Uh, Man, maybe we could interview both these guys separately as well. Now, Reef was near, I assume, a parking lot. His camera turned on briefly as I was uh, doing the 
preamble to the interview there, so I got a little look at the background of where he was, but I can tell you that sometimes you got to go to strange places to talk about strange stuff because you can't talk about it at home. Some of these pre-interviews I do, you know, the men or women are out walking their dog or, uh, you know, hanging out in a parking lot. And you see that all the time now, though, with something like COVID, people go crazy sitting in the same you know, 1,200, 1,500 square foot house waiting for their job to come back or for the symptoms to pass. We we call it COVID curbing, <laughs> where you're just basically hanging out on the street corner in your sedan, looking in the mirror, <laughs> wondering what's going to happen next. So th- that's, you know, produced because of a sort of trauma that's happening to a person, or at least a semi-stressful situation and what you heard was the telling of a trauma-based experience that you can't go to your avid shrink and discuss where are you going to go besides here if you can't go to your family you've got podcasts you've got uh, people on threads and Facebook and, and blogs and such but that's pretty much it conferences you can't really do those unless you go to a virtual one and we'll try to vamp those up again as well so um look forward to more on that and on the tail end here about virtual conferences i i did mention uh sasquatch rendezvous you can check that out a lot of good information on there beyond the world of sasquatch remember sasquatch is only the foundation on which this show was built on but the things connected to it the remote viewing the ufos the ghosts the other cryptids out there time distortion um, new ways new realities uh, these things are all present in this fantastic 12-hour webinar broken up over two days sasquatch rendezvous check it out again on facebook under my name toe johnson and the strange brow radio facebook page and uh, then some goodies also at patreon.com forward slash strange brow. Now, I am working on something uh, privately as well. I'm going to be leaving town for about five days to the Superstition Mountains in Arizona. And there I will be working with someone that we'll just call a mystic. And her name is Ira Wolfnosen. The website is uh, going to be released here on or near Halloween, heartunafraid.com. I've been insinuating about that on and off, but we are going to work as a team to look deeper into all these rabbit holes one-on-one. Strange Brow Radio is not going anywhere. It will change as far as delivery dates. I've spoken about that again, but just to reiterate, after October 31st, If you're not a Patreon member, you won't get a weekly show. The patrons will get a weekly show. The regular listener will still get a show monthly, and uh, we'll do four seasons a year. And each season will have four episodes within those seasons there. So look forward to those 16 episodes yearly. And they probably will be larger formatted episodes. Also, the YouTube channel, check that out. There'll be stuff coming up on that and a whole lot of other stuff. So uh, stay in tune for hardunafraid.com and what's coming up also with the documentary. There should be a crowdfunding very soon for the Al Moon Lab intro. It's not the Al Moon Lab documentary at all. We're just a part of it. And uh, the footage I saw is just amazing cinematography. Just some of the best cinematography I've seen on the subject matter. Short of actually having a Sasquatch run up on film, this is some beautiful, beautiful cinematography. So Mike Ferry, I believe, is in charge of uh, the the photo direction as well as uh, Brett Eichenberger of Resonance Production. If I didn't mention Mike Ferry in the beginning of the interview, just an amazing eye watching the guy work behind the camera. And super authentic people. And again, you can catch them at the Sasquatch Rendezvous Day 2. All right, that's it for me. I will see you next week or... 
I will see you in the trees. Oh, 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 oh,